Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grace Church here. Uh, those who are in the auditorium, those in the chapel, those out at Chaska, those who are watching online, and even those who will listen to this sermon and this service via podcast or streaming after today. Welcome you. You could have been anywhere for this is Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Uh, and so you're here, which to me means either you're visiting a family member um, and you're here, which thank you, or uh, you just didn't have the money to go on vacation, uh, but you're here. <laughs> so either way, you know, we're here, so we might as well make the most of it. Amen? Um, so before we hop into, into the sermon, I think most of you know that I am an Army chaplain. And so uh, as an Army chaplain, I have uh, several responsibilities that I'm tasked with doing, and they're all important. Uh, but one of the most important and one of my favorite tasks is actually rendering religious support to our soldiers. Uh, and so recently we did some training for three weeks and I had the opportunity to do field services. Now, for those of you who have been in the army or are in the army or the military, you know field services are short. So my field services are literally 15 minutes. So we do a worship song, we pray, we do a sermonette, or I do a sermonette, and offer communion to those who are believers all in the scope of 15 minutes. So for those of you who think that these services at Grace Church are too long, go join the army. <laughs> and you'll be just fine, all right? But here behind me, though, we have some uh, chapel services. And then uh, my two favorite picks here are actually the uh, last two. So this is Taylor, and Taylor uh, became a Christian with one of our chaplains, Chaplain Mooney, uh, and she actually got baptized, and that's what you call a, a field baptism. Uh, and so the, the baptismal pool in the picture is actually made out of crates, uh, a tarp, and uh, st uh, stress straps to hold it together. And so that's what it looks like. And then the last picture is actually Taylor and her brother. And her brother's in my battalion, or my unit, and so we had the pleasure of taking him to see his sister get baptized. Uh, and so I know a lot of times people are questioning, well, can you preach Jesus? Uh, he's like, yes. As a chaplain, when I have church service, I preach Jesus Christ just like I do here at Grace Church. And that is protected by the Constitution of the United States and other legal documents, other founding documents. So I don't have to compromise. Um, and then even when I do counseling, now when I do counseling, um, I ask, hey, like you're going through this situation, is it okay if I share some Bible verses with you? And to date, I have had zero soldiers to say, nope, I don't want to hear any Bible scripture. Uh, and so I give them the scripture, and oftentimes the, times, the response is, thank you, chaplain. This is just what I need. So know that just like God is working on the mission field with John Pipes and here at Grace Church, he's also working on the battlefield. So thank you for your support. And also thank Pastor Troy and Craig McLean, my boss, for allowing me to go and do that. Uh, so thank you to all of you. Now, when I'm at home and I'm not doing stuff for Grace Church and I'm not doing stuff for the Army, one of my favorite pastimes is actually watching old school television shows. So some of my favorite shows are, and some of you will recognize these, shows like Hogan's Heroes, Sheriff Matt Dillon of Gunsmoke, The Wild Wild West, The Jeffersons, Kung Fu, The Andy Griffith Show, The Rifleman, MASH, Matlock, Perry Mason, Gomer Powell, Bonanza, Benson, etc., etc., etc. Now, for many of you, you're like, wow, he just brought back some serious memories uh, from yesteryear. And for others of you, you're saying, like, none of those shows ring a bell. <laughs> if you fall in the second group of people, that means you're either on the younger end of the millennial scope or you're Generation Z, but it's all good. Uh, all I can say is TV back then was better than it is now. Amen? All right. Now... <laughs> But here's what I noticed, though, when I go back and watch those shows, uh, especially being in this day and age and watching those shows. The thing that I noticed is that um, it's, 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 it's interesting to see how society has shifted. Because when you watch these shows and even watch older movies, what you see is that these shows and the movies actually make uh, references that are honorable to God and to passages of Scripture. Uh, and it's actually quite, uh, quite elating to see that. Um, and so, but 
what I realized, though, is even back then, even Hollywood had some reverence for God back then. But somewhere in the late 70s and the early 80s, there was a shift. And instead of the culture being influenced by the church in this way, uh, now we see that the church, at least some parts of the church and some people in the church, are influenced in significant ways by the culture. Now, on the one hand, as a church, we need to know what's going on in the culture so that we can know how to make slight adjustments, slight adjustments to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to the culture in a way that's relevant. But at the same time, we should never conform to the world and we should never change our message. Yet we find that there are people who are trying to change doctrines that have been in place for centuries because they are conforming to the world instead of conforming to Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at six lessons that we see in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and this will help us to know how to deal with the pressure to conform to the world. If you would please stand with me, and we're going to read uh, the first nine verses of 1 Samuel, and then we'll tackle the rest of the verses later. So we're going to do this in sections, all right? So 1 Samuel, starting at verse 1. When Samuel, beca- when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods so that they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Most gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for all of these, my brothers and my sisters, your creation, your children, Lord. And and, and as we look at this text, Lord, take it and cut it up and customize it, Lord, and help each of us to get what we need to get from it and help us to yield to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, here in the text, we see that the elders of Israel come to Samuel and they inform him that they want to change from a theocracy where God is their king and they want to go to a monarchy where they have a human king. And the reason that they give is because they say Samuel's sons are corrupt and that they can't trust them. Now, it's important to understand that Samuel's sons were judges in Beersheba. Beersheba is actually a city that exists today in the nation of Israel. Today, Beersheba has um, 200,000 plus residents, and and it's in the southern extremity of Israel. But back in the time of our text here, Beersheba would have only had about 200 people. So the elders had a legitimate complaint where they're saying, hey, your sons are judges of 200 people and they are corrupt. There's no way that we can trust them to be judges over the entire nation of Israel. That is a legitimate concern. However, what is not legitimate is the fact that they wanted to change the system and replace God with a human king. That was not legitimate. In fact, their logic behind their request was flawed. How do we know that? Because they're saying, hey, they're making the assumption that, hey, the sons of a a judge can become corrupt, but the sons of a king cannot. In fact, we have the privilege of having the entirety of the Bible so we can see how this plays out. In fact, we already know that Saul, Saul was their first king. And he displeased God and was replaced by David. David had his own issues. Can you say Bathsheba? I have some Bible readers. Thank you. You already know what happened. Uh, For those of you who don't, go home and read it. All right? I don't have time to explain it today. Um, But then after David was king, David's son Solomon became king. Watch this. 
Solomon, the Bible says that he turned his heart away from God and did evil in the sights of the Lord. In fact, not only did Solomon do evil in the, in the sight of the Lord, but his son Rehoboam also did evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, Rehoboam was such an evil king that because of his evilness, God actually allowed the nation of Israel to be split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. So it's interesting that the elders come and they say, hey, we want a king because your sons are corrupt. And the very thing that they were trying to prevent is the very thing that they got. Why is that? It's because when you conform to the world, or conforming to the world starts with illogical justification. Conforming to the world, and this is point number one, starts with illogical justification. They had an illogical justification that, hey, we want a king because he's not going to be corrupt. That was illogical. But we do the same thing, single people. Like normally, I pick on married people, being married myself, but single people, I'm going to sit with you just for a moment. Because the trend now is for singles to say, hey, before we get married, let's live together. The justification, we can save money. That's actually not a bad reason. And we can get to know each other before we get married. Now, I will submit to you that it's a good idea to get to know the person that you're going to marry before you marry them. That's a good idea. But the method of living together before you do it is not a good idea. How do we know? We know because statistically speaking, people who live together before they get married actually have a higher divorce rate than people who do not live together before they get married. Why? Because the justification is illogical and it's antithetical or it's the opposite of what is biblically sound. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go to point number two. You all were quiet on that. Some of you are thinking, and I'm, I'm sure I stepped on somebody's toes, but it's all good. That's why we're here. I promise you later, I'll bring some, 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 uh, some peroxide and some band-aids later in the sermon. I promise you. Point number two. The people use Samuel's corrupt sons as their reason for wanting to, to replace God's system and God for a human king. And the text tells us that Samuel is displeased when this happens. But he's not displeased because they call his sons corrupt. He's displeased because they want to replace God as their king. But what's interesting is God doesn't get upset, but instead he tells Samuel, Samuel, this has actually been a thing in the making for some time now, and it didn't just start with you. And then he goes on to say that this actually started from the time that I brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, it's been some time since we've looked at Egypt. So let's recap right quick. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. God brought them out. What's interesting is when he brought them out, the Bible says that the Egyptians gave the Israelites so much gold and silver that it was as if the Israelites had plundered the Egyptians. God's favor. Then Pharaoh's army comes after the Israelites, and you've got Pharaoh's army behind them. You've got the Red Sea before them. God parts the Red Sea, and the Bible tells us that the Israelites walked across on dry land, and when Pharaoh's army came to pursue them, he allowed the Red Sea to close on Pharaoh's army and drown them and destroy them. Victory, military victory. But then the Bible also tells us that God actually allowed them to have clothes and shoes that did not fail them. They had manna and quail in the middle of the wilderness, and so God was their provider. Yet, when we get to chapter 32 in Exodus, what we find is that Moses is on Mount Sinai having a conversation with God, and the Israelites get tired of waiting on him, and they ask Aaron to build a golden calf to be their God. In fact, they say, come, let us make a God that shall go before us. Now, I don't know about you all, but my thought process is if a God can be made with human hands, that same God can be destroyed by human hands. And I don't want a God that can be destroyed by anybody. That was a great place to say what? 
So what we find is the Israelites have a history of rejecting God. But now, not only are they rejecting God, but they move from rejecting him to wanting to replace him. So then the question is, how could that happen? It happened because conforming to the world, point two, is a gradual process. Conforming to the world is a gradual process. Look, we have an enemy that is slick. The enemy doesn't want us to conform all at once. He tempts us and tries to get us to to conform bit by bit, step by step. First he says, hey, these friends are good for you, but how about don't hang with these friends, hang with these friends over here, and these are the friends that are actually going to be harmful for us. Uh, Then he says, hey, like you don't need to go to church every Sunday. You can go to church every other Sunday, and then before you know it, we're not going to church at all. Then he says, hey, you know what? Your family members are cool, but you don't need to be around your family members because they're always talking about God and Jesus and all that stuff. Why don't you get by yourself? And before you know it, we're in isolation. Bit by bit, step by step. And then when we're in isolation, then we find ourselves conforming to the world. And conforming to the world is never a good thing. But what I love about God is that he is wise and he is gracious because this is what he does. Again, he doesn't get upset. He says, hey, tell the Israelites about what's going to happen to them if they want to have this king. And so what Samuel does is in verses 10 through 18, he tells them exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to read it. Here's what I want you to do. A quick assignment. As I'm reading this text, count the number of times that we have that we say take, that I say take, okay, as in take away. So verse 10, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will, and he will appoint for himself commanders of, thou, of, of thousands and commanders of fifties and to, and to some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and the vineyards and the, and the olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants." He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tent of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. How many times did he say take? Six times. What is he taking? Their sons, their daughters, the best of their fields, their vineyards, their their orchards, a tenth of their grain, their male servants and female servants, the best of their young men and donkeys, and a tenth of their flocks, and then they too shall end up being slaves to the king. Now, here's what's interesting. As long as God was their king, they did not have to give up this stuff. But as soon as they wanted to conform to the world, then it ended up costing them stuff, and it actually ends up costing them more than they ever wanted to give up. Or would want to give up. Likewise, God is telling us today in the 21st century, brothers and sisters, that whenever we conform to that which is not of God, we should not expect to keep that which is from God. Whenever we conform to that which is not of God, we should not expect to keep that which is from God. In other words, we should not expect to conform to the world and still have the peace of God in our lives. We should not expect to conform to the world and still have God's joy or his patience or his kindness in our lives. In fact, there are some among us right now who have conformed. You conformed and did things the world's way and it cost you your family. It cost you relationships. It cost you knowing who you are. It cost you your self-worth. It cost you your job all because you chose to conform to the world. Who am I preaching to right now? In a room this size, yes, most of us are believers, but even in the room this size, there is somebody who conformed and it costs you stuff that you still have never gotten back. 
Better yet, there is somebody now who's contemplating conforming to the world, and I am sounding the alarm to tell you that it is going to cost you more than you want to pay. It's going to make you stay longer than you want to stay. Because that is what conforming to the world does. It costs us that which we don't want to give up. But I got some good news for you. Because even when we conform to the world, there are two things that God leaves on the table for us to get right with him. Number one, his love is everlasting. We have a God whose love is everlasting. And so even when we conform to the world, to the person who has conformed to the world and you've lost more than you wanted to lose, to the person who was thinking about conforming, to the person who's in the process of conforming to the world, we have a God who loves us and gives us the opportunity to, here's number two, to ask for forgiveness, to repent. To repent means to metanosete. Metanosete is this. If God is right here, then I am right here and I am conforming to the world. But we have the opportunity to metanosete, which is to turn from conforming and turn back to God. Somebody in here needs to do a metanosete today. I don't know who it is, but you're in here. Do not let these words fall on shallow ground in your heart because the alarm is being sounded today. Who are you who has conformed and who has not yet repented? Who are you who is conforming and you need to repent? Who are you who is thinking about conforming? Point number three, conforming to the world will cost us more than we want to pay. Conforming to the world will cost us more than we want to pay. Now, let's keep it going because Samuel tells the people everything that it's going to cost them. And let's look at the people's response because this is interesting. Verse 19, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. Verse 20, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us, watch this, and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Here's point number four. Samuel tells the people everything that they're going to have to pay in order to have a king over them. What's interesting is they don't receive it. They don't receive it. The reason that's interesting is because, remember, the word came from God. God had never lied to them because God is not a man that he should, what, lie God had never lied to them. Samuel was the trusted judge who had never lied to them. God had spoken through other judges who had not lied to them. Yet, they get this word from God via Samuel and they don't receive it. You want to know why? Here's point number four on your document. Because conforming to the world eventually brings rejection of God's truth. Conforming to the world eventually brings rejection of God's truth. You see, to conform to the world is to agree with the world, to be similar to the world. Again, if the world is here and God is here, I can't do both. That's why Matthew 6.24 says that no one can serve two masters, for either we will hate the one and love the other, or we shall be devoted to the one and despise the other. Either we love God and are devoted to him, or we love the world and are devoted to the world, but we cannot be split because God and the world are polar opposites as far as from an ethical standpoint. Now, they're not polar opposites as far as the world being equal to God in strength and power because you do realize that our God has no equal who is opposite to him as far as strength and power. But when it comes to ethical issues, and when it comes to holiness and righteousness, the world is the antithesis of God. Point five, 
in verse 20, the people's real motive comes out because the people say, hey, we want a king to judge us and also to go and win and fight our battles for us. So again, let's dig into this right quick because on the surface, it makes sense. Because realize that at this point, the nation of Israel, they were tribes. They had the 12 tribes, right? So their army really looks more like a big militia. It wasn't a developed army like the Philistines would have had and the the Amorites and all of the nations that were around them. Their army was not that organized. And so for whatever reason, they're thinking, hey, we need a king so that the king can develop a standing army so that we can be powerful and fight the people who are coming against us. We need to be competitive against them. We need to level the playing field. So again, on the surface, that makes sense. But, it, but, but remember point one, conforming to the world starts with illogical justification. Here's why. Because when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 7, so the, the, the chapter preceding this, we get the true story. It's on, so it's on the screen. Watch this. 1 Samuel chapter 7, 7 through 14 says this. And now the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered in Mizpah, and the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And so Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord of Israel, and the Lord answered him, As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack. Watch this. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. So look, victory. God allows a clap of thunder to come, and that is the spark of the Philistines being defeated. But it gets better. Watch this. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as as below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. But watch 14, verse 14. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Elkron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Watch this. The Philistines are about to attack Israel, the same Israel that doesn't have a king and who has tribes and has more of a militia for an army. God allows a clap of thunder to come to cause confusion for the Philistines, and they're in disarray. Israel attacks and chases them as far as they can. So they have victory. They have a miraculous military victory. But not only that, they also get back land and territory that the Philistines had taken from them. And not only that, but the Amorites see what has happened between the Israelites and the Philistines. And they say, hey, you know what, Israelites, we're good. We don't want any of that. You do you, and we'll do us, and we're good. Holla at your boy. Peace. That's what they said. So when you look at chapter 7, it does not make sense that here in chapter 8, they're saying we want a king to judge us, and we also want a king to fight our battles for us. Because they have a God who is literally undefeated, except for a few times. Watch this. The only time... The Israelites were defeated in battle is when they were disobedient to God and God allowed them to lose so that they could be disciplined. That's the only time that they were ever defeated in battle. So I'm thinking, hmm, you mean to tell me the only thing I need to do to win every battle is be obedient to God who is gracious and merciful and who is not unreasonable? I'll take that any day. But instead, what they do is they say, hey, let's get rid of God and let's replace him with a human king. So then, why does this happen? I'll tell you why. Point number five, because conforming to the world makes us forgetful and unappreciative of God's greatness. 
Conforming to the world makes us forgetful and unappreciative of God's greatness. Look, again, if the world is here, the more we look at the world, the more we conform to the world, the more we listen to the world, then the less impact God's word is going to have on us and the less appreciative and the more forgetful we become. Because if we are focused on conforming to the world, then we are not even realizing the goodness and the greatness of God who still keeps us despite the fact that we've turned our backs to him. And this leads us to point six, because point six says this in verse 22, God tells Samuel to obey their voices and give them what they want. Now realize God did not have to give them a human king. He chose to give them a human king. Why? Because at this point, they didn't want to believe truth. They had what, they had what the Bible calls a reprobate mind. In other words, it's possible to get to a point where you are so bent on doing what you want to do that you say, God, later. And God says, you know what? I love you so much, and I'm such a gentleman that I'm going to let you take the path that you want to take. But when we take that path, we find out that all there is is death, damnation, and destruction. I feel like I'm stepping on some toes right now. Whose toes are being stepped on right now because you have decided that you want to do what you want to do. You don't care what mama and daddy said. You don't care what your boss said. You don't care what the pastor said. You don't care what the Bible says. You don't care what God said. But again, the good news is we got God's love and his forgiveness. So if you're willing to turn around and metanosete, God is standing here today with open arms. So point six is this. At the end of the day, conforming to the world makes us victims of our own folly. Conforming to the world makes us victims of our own folly. Now, I'm bringing my plane in for a landing. So here's the deal. Today, we've looked at the consequences of yielding to pressure to conform to the world. Here's what we got to know. Whenever we conform to the world, it is not going to work out well for us. It's not. So we have to be willing to do that which God has ordained us to do. So then how do we do that? Three things that we need to take away. How do we not conform to the world? Number one, we know that the battle to get us to conform to the world's standards is fought and won in two places, our minds and our hearts. Our minds and our hearts. Remember, in the first section of this chapter, the Israelites had an illogical justification so it starts in our hearts and travels, excuse me, starts in our minds and travels down to our hearts. Number two, we must always filter our words, thoughts, actions, and passions through the word of God. When we're thinking about saying stuff, thinking stuff, doing stuff, and stuff that we're passionate about, we have to be able to filter that through the word of God to say, okay, does this line up with God's word? If it does, great. If it does not, we need to press pause immediately. Because here's the great thing about God. God gives us a road map. The question is, do we want to take the road map? That's why one of the greatest tricks of the enemy, and you've heard us say this before at this church because we believe in the unadulterated word of God, but that's why one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to get Christians to not read the Bible. I think the next big trick is to get Christians to not come to church. Number three, number three, we must always remember, appreciate, and teach what God has done for us so that we and the generations after us will forever remember his greatness. Look, we must always remember, appreciate, and teach the greatness of God. Because here's the deal. Even when you look at our country now, it doesn't take a genius to see that we don't teach history and teach people how to think the way we used to. And again, I used to be a teacher. I taught high school, and I taught on the collegiate level, so I am not hating on teachers because the fact of the matter is the teachers get the books and stuff that, uh, that are ordained from the legislatures and even from federal government. So teachers are dealing with what they have. But we don't teach history. 
and we have a generation of folks who don't appreciate the history of our country. I'll say it, as a black American, we don't teach the struggles of our forefathers and foremothers the way we used to. And so we have a generation of people who don't appreciate struggling and being able to make something out of nothing. And that's not just for black Americans, that's for all Americans. That's why we have this mentality of entitlement in our country because we don't teach the struggles. Where there is no struggle, there is no gain. We have forgotten about teaching the struggles that our forefathers and foremothers went to. But watch this. If it's important to teach the struggles of a country, how much more important is, for, is it for us to teach the struggles of our Christian forefathers and foremothers and to teach the struggles of the early church so that our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren appreciate the struggles so that we hold fast to the word of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whereby there is no other and whereby there is no other name whereby man can be saved. We got to teach it. We got to teach it. We got to remember it, we got to appreciate it, and we got to teach it, right? Um, and in and, and doing that, that is what helps us to overcome the pressure to conform to the world. Now, as I close out this four-week series, because this has been a four-week series entitled When Facing, Pastor Troy talked about facing anxiety, facing temp temptation and setbacks, and today we talked about when facing pressure to conform. All of us have and will face those things. If you haven't faced it yet, hold on. Soon enough, you will. In fact, after hearing this sermon, you'll probably face something uh, this week. I don't know. I'm just playing. But sooner or later, you will face anxiety. You will face temptation. You will face setbacks. And you will face pressure to conform. When you face those things, do not yield to the pressure to conform. How do we do that? Always remember that God is bigger than every situation that we will ever face. And there is, again, no enemy that can defeat God. And the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Think about that. More than a conqueror. What, like, how can you be more than a conqueror? You're more than a conqueror because somebody else is fighting on your behalf. All you got to do is stay faithful and endure to the end. Everybody's standing. So in this sermon series, when facing, know that we're going to face stuff. But again, the way we overcome the stuff that we face, because it's going to be more than anxiety, temptation, setbacks, and pressure to conform. We're going to face, have faced, are facing more than that in this day and age. But when we face them, we got to stay focused on God, and we, gotta, uh, we have to measure stuff by the Bible, not our mentality, not our thinking. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, we got to press pause. I tell the story. There's a young lady uh, who goes to this church, and she was uh, out in Hollywood. And so her desire and her passion, her gifting, is to make movies. And so she actually had an internship uh, with the company. But what she found is that in Hollywood, she was like, like I, I am going to have to compromise my Christian values too much to be out here. So she actually prayed and made the decision to come back home. And now she's doing things differently. So she's still going to do what God wants her to do. She's still going to make films, but she's taking a different pathway and taking a different avenue to get into doing what she believes God has called her to do. Because she's not going to compromise and not going to yield to the pressure to conform. It's the same for us. Your thing might not be making movies, but there is an area where God wants you to conform. I mean, not, not God, well, God wants you to conform to him, but there's an area where the enemy wants you to conform to the world. Do not conform, brothers and sisters. Most gracious God, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. And Lord, we all have pressure, pressure to conform somewhere, somehow, some way. But Lord, give us wisdom. Give us supernatural wisdom and discernment so that we can see when and where the enemy is trying to get us to conform. And help us, most gracious God, to overcome the temptation to conform. Help us, Heavenly Father, to walk in your righteousness and in your light so that we can be the persons you've called us to be. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming out today.
Thank you for coming out today. If you need prayer, we have the prayer room over here to my right, your left. Uh, I'll be down here if you need to talk. Thank you very much. Have a safe Labor Day tomorrow. And again, thank you. Be blessed.